This week on The Handle. Meet an Amarillo artist who digs the earth. Learn from a Canyon pharmacist turned mead maker. And watch Fall's favorite gourd come alive. All of this right now on Panhandle PBS as we tell the stories of the Texas Panhandle. A lot of people just look at a mug as a mug. Just a mug. But it's just not. <laughs> but it is. It is in so many circumstances. And it's so important today, especially today. I, I feel this more than ever now because people are so disconnected from nature and they're so disconnected from things around them because they're constantly looking at screens. And if you see a piece of pottery on Instagram, well, you're only seeing one side of it. And it's a tactile thing. And, you know, if it's heavy or if it's light or if it's like not totally round. Those are, you know, I think about that all the time. It's just like that's humanness in the clay. So I'm Kent Harris and I'm the owner and potter here at Blue Sage Pottery in Amarillo, Texas. The clay records everything you do to it. You can't help it. I love it. In my classes, I see this with people, you know, they just want to try to control everything. You cannot control it, you know, until you've done it a really long time and then you don't really want to control it. It's just, it's like a river coming out of you. It's really awesome. I think for me, it, it all started, I was born in Western North Carolina and my parents collected pots to use in the house. And that's where I was born in Asheville, North Carolina is the heart really of American craft. And so, you know, there's, there's some pieces that go back in our family over a hundred years, but it was never a thing to be coveted. There were always things to be used. And I think looking back that growing up in a house where there were handmade mugs around and handmade bowls and we were using them, it just kind of got into me a little bit. And so I took a class in high school and I tried the potter's wheel and I loved it, but I didn't think about it until much later. And I came back to it in college. And that's where I met Megan, my wife, and she was doing her um, post back at WT in ceramics. And so we kind of, that's how it all happened. And then we went to the, the University of North Texas. And at University of North Texas, that was the top ceramics program in the country. And it was just right for me. And when I left there, I knew that's exactly what I was gonna do. So I was gonna be a studio potter in America, even though it seemed like that was impossible. And I'll tell you the thing that really did it to me was in one of my critiques um, with my professor, Elmer Taylor at University of North Texas, he told me it was impossible to be a potter, a studio potter in America and actually make a living. And that was one of his ways looking back later, because we became friends later. That was his way to motivate me, and send me on. Like, if you think you can do it, then you can do it. You know, and so I did. We left UNT because he had told me that. And I said, you're right. I don't need to be here. I'm just going to go do it. That's how it really happened. My wife, Megan, and I started in 2003, actually in Canyon first. So, and we opened the business as just, um, we needed a studio to work in as we were finishing at WT. So we opened a little pottery space there and kind of built on the success of that. We moved that here to Amarillo because as we both graduated, we knew we wanted to make pots. So we needed a space to do it. And these stores had been in Megan's family for about 30 years. Certainly the most popular thing I make is the microwave bacon cooker, for sure. You know, I had no idea how popular that was gonna be and that it works and that's why it's popular. Um, I mean, I make everything from cups, mugs, plates, tableware to, I make cremation urns also. And that, that is a big part of our business. I mean, that is really, that's moving forward. And that's, that's kind of a service for me I felt really strongly about that when I started making those, because I've made them throughout the years for people when they would come to me and ask, but um, I've started, started moving into that market also. What really spurred me to make those is I had made, I had made, a woman had come in and asked me to make one for her son, and so I made six, because I, I couldn't, she couldn't really tell me what she liked, so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll make six different ones. And she came in and I had them up on a counter, and she just, I mean, she lost her breath when she saw this one, and she just picked it up and held it in her hands like this. And she said, it's perfect. And I thought, wow. I mean, that's, that's reacting. It, like, just for a second gave her comfort. That's it. I mean, that's, that's where I thought, well, this is, that's what I should be doing, too. I'm the visiting assistant professor of art at WT. So I teach two sections of ceramics and then sculpture. 
And so the sculpture is really wonderful for me because I've, I have so many ideas for sculpture because I work in three dimensions all the time and never have any time to execute it. So I can, I can kind of spill all these ideas that I have and thoughts and let them run with it. It's really fun. I mean, they, they're learning to use their own creativity, which is great. It's just fun for me to be out of here also and be there, making things in a different place around their energy. You know, my ceramics class, I just work in there with them. It's just really exciting to work around younger people who are considering a career in art or maybe they want to teach. So I love that. When I'm not making pots, I'm not the same person. <laughs> I know that. It calms me down. I, honestly, I think the thing that it really does for me is that it, and it's the historical aspect of pottery, that if uh, those are objects throughout time, it's basically like you're basically leaving your mark in stone. I mean, once the clay's fired, it's here forever. And so the oldest pots that I've been in contact with are about 9,000 years old. And it had the maker's fingerprints all over it. And right there you think, this is, that's power. I mean, that is, that's incredible. You know, it's like, you want to leave your mark. And I just wanted to, that's, I know that's part of it for me is like sentimentality. I want, I like the fact that those objects are here and that's, that's like my expression going through time, you know. But then the other part of it, and there's so many parts, the other part of it is that they, they can be used and they're in a house and someone's having contact with a work of art every day. You know, like the mug is the most intimate object that you can have. I mean, it touches your mouth. And for so many of my customers, it's the first thing they touch in the morning, sometimes at night. When I start in the morning, I honestly, now this is in my maturity as a maker. You know, when I used to make things, I w it was very conscious. Now my best pots are unconscious. Like I'll start in the morning and say, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make mugs or something. And I just start. I try not to think too much. I just like I'm reacting to it. So I'm coming up and you know, like I'm, I move one area of the clay and I think, well, that, that's kind of a neat area for texture. So I'll put texture on it. I try not to be too critical on myself because my best pieces, or I, I don't ever remember them. I see them later and you think, man, that was pretty good. That was really good. It's because your tech, you've digested your technique and that's how, it's just different. It's hard to explain, you know? I mean, all those dishes I made for six car, I can look back, I mean, I, there were some, you know, you might think they're all alike, well, they're not. Like, I mean, they're, it's like a giant family. And there's some of those that I had a real hard time letting go down there. You know, because you know, you're putting them into an environment where they're gonna get used, they're gonna get broken. And there were some that were just drop dead gorgeous, like, oh man, I hope that happens again, <laughs> you know? But it's not. The thing I love about clay the most, it's not the, it's not the feel, it's the smell of it. And my students at WT the other day, I think they were making fun of me because I had just buried my face in a bag of clay because I could smell it again. It, it was a different clay and it smelled more musty than the clay I use. I mean, it's like you, you become nose blind to it, you know? I mean, I'm sure it smells musty in here to you right now. I don't smell it at all, you know? <laughs> all the clays are different too. Like I just tried 17 different clays to see if I could get a new one. And porcelain is so smooth and so pure. And the clay I use is usually has more iron in it. It's more impure, a little rocky. You never know what you're gonna get there. Little iron specks show up in it. They're almost like moles and I love that. I like the things that I don't know are gonna happen. You can make it predictable. I don't want predictable at all. That's what keeps you coming back. That's what makes you wake up early Christmas morning. I mean, what's gonna happen, you know? And so, I mean, there are things that you can do to make it very regular, but that is very boring. I won't go down that road. I've been down that road. It's not the road I like at all, you know? The first stoneware glazes, I work in stoneware, were made from wood ashes, and that originated about 4,700 years ago in China because they were firing wood-fired pottery kilns and eventually they were so genius that they tipped the wood-fired kilns up a hill at about a 40 degree angle. And then that wood ash would get drug up on the sides of the pots and they could watch it melt. And then they were so smart that they thought, well, if we mix that ash with water and a little clay to bind it, then you get a whole glaze coating that's easy to clean. Yeah, I'm sure that's what they were thinking. So, and then you have celadon glazes and things like that that show up. But the reason I like that is because there's such a dynamic surface and you never, ever know what you're gonna get. 
you get, I get the whole spectrum of glossy to matte to crystals in there. And it can be a nightmare sometimes, but most of the time it's pretty good. I fire usually between 50 and 60 times a year, sometimes more. And even still, it is, even if I've used those ash glazes in the previous firing, still to spend the six hours to get the thing loaded and all in there, I think the whole time I'm thinking, oh, this is the one. This is the one where I'm gonna get bit, you know? And that it's just because it's happened. And you, you know, that's where it keeps you on the edge of your seat, you know? I mean, you get your confidence up, but the thing is, is like, if you didn't love to do it, you couldn't keep going. I mean, you have to be okay with, you know what? It might all get broken, but I had a great time making it. I'll do it again. You know, and that's so many people ask about the six car dishes. Like, oh, you must be terrified that they, you know, someone breaks them all. It's like, well, you don't get it. Like, I love making them. I'd be happy to make them again. <laughs> like, it's not about the money. It's about the joy of making it. That's what's so fun. And I love being a human that makes things. And I wish everybody made things. What feeds me just to yeah, keep making? Energy or... Is that one day I'm not going to be able to make them anymore. I'll, hopefully I'll die making pots when I'm about 102. Because my worst fear on earth is to not have pots to make. And that is an absolute fact. <laughs> like, I swear that's my only anxiety is that I will run out of customers that want to buy things and love my pots. Talk about being on Route 66. <laughs> you never know who's gonna come in, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really fun. And I didn't think about it too much when we opened up. But the, the European, I get Russian traffic coming through, Germans. Uh, we've had very famous people come in that unfortunately I didn't know that that was them until they left. You know, in 2000, I think it was 2008, Paul McCartney came in with his wife. And I didn't know it was him. <laughs> I was just working. So they had pulled up that morning. It was about 10 in the morning. I guess they'd stay at the Ambassador. I didn't know. And they pulled up out front in their little silver Ford Bronco. It was like a, it was a 1990 silver Bronco, something like that. The reason I remember it's because a guy I knew in high school had his stolen, and so I thought, oh, that's interesting. And this woman got out, who very clearly was not from the Texas Panhandle, and she came to the door and asked if they could look around. I said, sure, yeah, I mean, the open sign's there. And so she goes back to the car and gets him. She whispers something, and this little man, or. I couldn't really tell, came around the car, and he had a longer coat on and kind of a weird wig. I thought it was a wig and big glasses, so I thought, well, that's a strange looking person. He just went back to work. And they made two laps around the store, and I did what I always do, and I went to the door there as they were leaving, and she said, thank you so much, it was very beautiful. And he turned around and smiled at me, and when he smiled at me, I thought, that looks familiar, that's somebody. <laughs> And then my mother-in-law called 30 minutes later to tell me that they'd stay at the Ambassador. They're doing Route 66 for his 64th birthday. I thought, oh my gosh, they were just here. And I missed it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my Paul McCartney story. <laughs> <laughs>
into that winery category. It probably should be by itself. So there's some education about what meat is. And so you really have to open up your mind and say, this is from honey. And so I think originally for me, this is different, it's unique. I try to compare it to something else when really, you really shouldn't. The nice thing about mead, you know, all fermentation, you have to start with a sugar source. So grains or grapes, uh, which you have to really sort of break down. Yeah. And with, with beer, you, you don't need too many nutrients. You don't have to add a lot of that. But with, with honey, it is void of some yeast nutrients. So that's something else. There's some education on my end. You know, what, what do these yeasts need? What kind of nitrogen sources that, that honey is, is a lot of times void in? So there's some research as far as how to get this fermentation to go through and, and to get where I want it. When you were in pharmacy school, did you ever think that this was the direction you'd go? No. You know, that's, you know, even when we started this last year, I thought maybe in four to six years I can back off to some degree and be down here. And after six months of, you know, doing full time pharmacy and down here is just it's a lot. The fermentation makes, it makes sense in my, in my mind. It's a pretty easy process. Uh, you get a sugar source, you add yeast, you get carbon dioxide and ethanol. So that makes sense. There is, there is some kind of that child, you know, science lab. Uh, experiment, which is fun. That's an experiment with, with the different flavors of the mead that we want. So uh, orange blossom, clover, I've been to cranberry, a wildflower, they all impart different flavors, which is pretty cool. Now the different yeast as well can, can do that. So I'm still trying to learn what really I want to do. And, and I think ultimately get a base mead, this is where I want to go with it, and then do some other things. Add fruits, we, I've already sort of done that. Add raspberries, add blackberries, you know, then give it a more uh, uh, fruity taste compared to just a traditional mead which is just honey and water. How do you introduce mead to your customers? Yeah, so usually the first thing, um, you know, have you had mead? And most times, no. And then try to at least get them educated about fermentation, sugar sources, how all fermentation, how all alcohol is produced, and then get them in to the mead. Most of them with wine, they absolutely know what wine is, and then try to just get them, baby step them to what we're doing with the mead. Teach us. So normally if someone comes in, you know, again, have you had meat before? And most of them, no. And so I like to show them, just start with the traditional meat, which again is just honey and water. Uh, and they can run anywhere from say, six to 19% alcohol. So a lot of the ones I'm doing around 12 and a half percent. So about, about like a wine. Uh, I've got one on tap now, which is just a, a base traditional meat called the Queen's Revenge. We like to play, have playful names. So the Stinger, the Forger, Citrus Swarm, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm usually gonna pour them for sure this uh, Queen's Revenge, and I, I put my stuff on in kegs and put it on CO2. Number one, I don't have the storage for bottles, you know, but really I like to give it a little bubbly, you know, so it is a little more um, beerish. So if they're gonna get into it, it's not gonna be the, a real still uh, meat. So that, I think, helps. Um, I've got one that's a, it's a raspberry now, so I used the base mead and really boiled a lot of raspberries, made a tea out of it, and got it to where I wanted it. It's got a beautiful color. I'm gonna start a cranberry, since it's that time of year uh, coming up. We've got some other stuff that I like to do. One is coming out of Denmark, and it's the extreme of mead. It's 19%, it's huge, and it's called Viking's Blood. So this is gonna be, you know, mead is, they would say, the drink of the gods. So this is the Vikings, this is, a long time ago, uh, so me. So usually I get three or four, I'll drop down to, again, these are running 12%, 19%. We can come down to uh, something fun, like a lemon out of Austin, Texas, Meridian Hive. Uh, so just the color variation, you know, flavor-wise. We even got, have slushies. We want to educate people about the honeybees, how important they are to our environment, to our society. So we do classes, we do beginning bee classes, uh, and then just because, uh, maybe you don't want a hive. We still do tours and education. So you can come out, talk bees, and get in a beehive, get suited up, and get in a hive. I'm uh, Scott Cummins, and this is Perryton, Texas at Perryton Junior High School. I uh, carve pumpkins in my classroom. What is it about us and pumpkins? I don't know, but everybody seems to like pumpkins. I would post pumpkins on my website and I'd get a lot of, you know, feedback and people saying nice things and stuff like that, sure, but there's always, there's always people that had some advice for me. And, you know, like that I needed to start carving 
wooden walking sticks or I needed to start carving um, figurines and or they would even suggest that uh, I needed to do, do the same kind of characters and faces and things like that, but carve them into something else besides pumpkins. I was like, what? And they would also say, you know, you, you should get uh, fake pumpkins and do it on fake pumpkins so they'll last. But really, that kind of takes the whole novelty away from it. I think one of the reasons people like it is because it's really just, it's just there for a while. So if you make it too permanent, you, you lose something there. start I just want to tell you a couple things we usually do okay ignore the cameras um, and just talk to me right okay. here and the other thing is um, just when we first start we always say I always have somebody say their name and where they're or, and what they do their name and what they do okay so I'm going to say welcome and then you do that very good Welcome to the Panhandle PBS studio, Mr. Lestrange. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for keeping it dark in here. Uh, I'm Brian Lestrange. Uh, I work in extraction. It's an ancient art form that I learned eons ago. Okay. So where are you from? Originally from Transylvania, but uh, I've lived all over. Rome, Athens, Barcelona, wherever the spirit moves me. I enrolled in Amarillo College 90 years ago, Mortuary Sciences. Uh, wonderfully dead industry. I prefer more to work with my fangs instead of my hands. <laughs> but seriously, I love Amarillo College. They've got a great dental hygiene program. What is a typical day like for a vampire living in Amarillo? Well, a day for me uh, involves night. I work at night. Um, I don't get out of my coffin as much as I should, but uh, I, your Panhandle PBS has helped me to become more of a social creature. But the daytime schedule for me tends to make me go up in flames. Is it your whole family that, that watches, or? Yes, yes. my. Uh, my two kids have watched Sesame Street for 50 years. It's where they learned to count. You, you said you watched The Handle. I love The Handle, that local show that you guys do. You cover so much cool stuff. The glass blower that you guys did, that's outstanding. And the sod poodle story that you did, that was fabulous. So you're a baseball fan? Love baseball. Can't go to too many day games, but and have to go late at night. But uh, the games are a lot of fun. I didn't care for the team name, like a lot of people. You know, I would have preferred something like Amarillo Bloodsuckers or maybe Amarillo Mosquitoes. But you know, they won the championship, so it worked out for them. You said you took this. Help, our show has helped you get out more. You took a stroll. Recently? I did. You guys cover so much local stuff and you did the thing on Lano Cemetery. I got out at dusk one night and went to visit some very old friends. I hear you're a bit of a renaissance man. Maybe a little bit in a past life. Um, you guys did the thing on the, the paintings in the alley. Reminded me of uh, the ones that were inspired by the Sistine Chapel. I remember when Mike was painting those, he always complained about a backache. Mike? Michelangelo, hello. And as a Renaissance man, I, I understand you like cooking as well. I do, I've learned to love steak. Not that kind. The kind that you guys featured Rory Sapizi on the handle. Yes. Wonderful steak, barely kissed by a flame, still blood red almost. No garlic though. No, I garlic. No. Okay. No garlic. 
Did you watch Kim Burns Country Music or, or our episode on Bob Wills? I watched both of them. Loved that the Bob Wills story was great and country music, 16 hours. It was fabulous, but 16 hours of it, they didn't even talk about my favorite Patsy Klein song, Walking After Midnight. So where do you turn to fill your music needs? Amarillo College's FM 90. They got this show called Dead in Street. It's wonderful. They do the goth rock sometimes on when it began. It's fabulous. You know, I try and share some of my Spotify playlists with the DJs there. They don't get back to me. You're a transplant to Amarillo, so what makes you stay? Amarillo is so wonderful, and you guys have shown such great things on the handle, but really, the wide open skies, and there's not very much light at night. I can fly, but the skies are so beautiful. Everybody talks about the, the magical sunsets, but what about the moon rises, huh? Did you see that blood moon that we had a few weeks ago? Gorgeous. What do we need to do again? <laughs> <laughs>